thank the speaker, of thank the <laughs> organizer for, for inviting me. It's really my pleasure to be here. So uh, um, today I'm going to talk about controllability and observability of complex systems. Uh, the work was uh, mainly done during my postdoc period in, uh, at um, Northeastern University. And now I'm a, um, a junior faculty at Harvard Medical School and Brigham and Women's Hospital. So first part is about the control. And uh, a good example talking about control is always a car, because we drive a car daily, and a car has more than 5,000 components. But yet, we really think about those, the need to control each of them independently. Because uh, according to our daily experience, we um, rely on three key components, the steering wheel, the gas pedal, and uh, the brake to get us anywhere where the car can go. The reason is that setting motion hundreds of components um, when we change the state of these variables by pushing on the gas, for example, or moving the steering wheel. Yet we are not aware of most of them. This is because the car is built to be controllable uh, from these three components. There are no loose components. There's no wheels or pistons that can choose to live their own lives. So what, however, if we are asked to solve the inverse problem, you are given the car's electrical and uh, mechanical wiring diagram, and you know nothing about how a car works. Suppose you just arrived from the Mars. Uh, you never seen a car, but you need to figure out which other uh, control nodes. Would you be able to ever identify those um, um, steering wheel, the gas pedal, and the brake uh, as, as being the three uh, control nodes of the system? Well, this is not such a far-fetched question, however. Uh, in fact, the questions a biologist uh, face when they try to make sense of cells wiring diagram for example, here I'm showing you the protein-protein interaction network. And uh, the biologists, they always try to find the driver nodes that can control the cellular dynamics. And how do we figure out what governs complex diseases like asthma, heart disease, or cancer? And talking about controllability, I have to mention a gentleman here. Oh, by the way, I would like to encourage you to be uh, interactive, to ask me questions, because if you don't, I will ask you questions. So don't leave the question to the end. So. <laughs> One question is for you. Can you recognize this gentleman in this slide? Of course, not this one. Uh, this one. Anyone? No? His name is Rudolf Kamen. Have you heard of Kamen filter? That's the Kamen, the Kamen um, in control theory. Um, he's, he was recognized as uh, one of the fathers of modern, modern control theory. And in 2009, he got the National Science Medal. That's the picture I uh, took from the uh, ceremony. And uh, in seven, in six, um, Common wrote a very famous paper talking about the controllability and observability of uh, dynamic systems. Um, so roughly speaking, uh, suppose we have a dynamic system. Uh, controllability denotes our ability to control a system. More precisely, it denotes our ability to move a system around in its entire state space using only certain um, admissible manipul manipulations. For example, we have a, a, a network of n nodes. Each node has a state variable associated with it. Then the state space is n-dimensional. And uh, if the system is controlled, that means we can drive the system from any initial state, any point in the state space, to any other um, um, final state within finite time. If that's doable, then the system is called controllable. Of course, uh, this agree well with our intu intuition about controlling the system. Um, in the first part of my talk, I'm talking about controllability, and I'm going to focus on, I'm going to focus on linear system, because uh, I was trained as a statistical physicist. And uh, we would like, as physicists, we always um, like to work on a toy model. And uh, by studying linear dynamics, we want to uh, push the com complexity to the um, network structure. We want to study the impact of network structure on the simplest dynamics, linear dynamics. So suppose we have a linear time invariant system on the uh, dynamic system on the network, which is described by these ODEs, um, ordinary differential equation x dot equal ax plus bu. Just imagine you have a very tiny network with only four nodes. And the A matrix in control theory is called state matrix, but in network language, it's nothing but the weighted wiring diagram. And here, we are controlling this network with two independent signals applied to uh, node 1 and node 2 with two independent signals, U1 and U2. The B matrix here is the so-called input matrix, which is nothing but the control configuration. It tells us uh, which nodes we are directly controlling. 
So um, one fundamental contribution of uh, common uh, in control theory is the, the rank condition for uh, checking the controllability of linear time invariant system. Basically, this system is controllable if and only if its controllability matrix has full rank. And this controllability matrix has a very um, um, a strange um, form. And I'm going to explain why this, this definition of controllability mat uh, matrix makes sense in a few slides. So I'll give you a few examples. We have four small networks. In the first case, we have a direct path, and we are controlling the first guy. Well, using our imagination, we know that this system is controllable because we are controlling the first guy. But I'm going to show you why it works. Suppose you have a direct star, and you are controlling the central guy. The system is not controllable. But why? I'm going to tell you why in a few minutes. To rescue the system, to make this system controllable, we can either add a self-loop to node 2 or node 3, like this, or we can just introduce additional signal to make the system controllable. So what happens in this case? Well, this is because the system is stuck in a particular subspace in the phase space. So the system cannot get out of this plane. That's the reason why it's uncontrollable. Um, but first of all, let me explain why um, a direct path by controlling the force guy, the system is controllable. Uh, for simplicity, let's uh, think about the discrete time uh, dynamics so that we can um, work out the algebra very easily. So assume that in the initial state, the system is in the origin of the state space. Then you can basically uh, work out the, the state sequence. For example, at t equal 1, this is the state vector. At t equal 2, this is the state vector. This is the state vector at t equal 3. At this moment, you will realize that this state vector is nothing but a product of a matrix times the, in, the input sequence, the signal sequence. And this matrix is nothing but the controllability matrix. You see, this column is the, the B. In this case, we have, a, uh, we have a, a single input. So the B matrix is, is a vector. And this column is A times B. This column is A squared times B. And because this matrix has full rank, so um, for any given final state, we can choose the input sequence to make the system um, uh, go to the final state because this, this matrix has full rank. So I can ask a question. Sure. I don't understand the term full rank. Full rank just means, for example, this matrix has three <coughs> independent columns. Those columns are independent. That's what full rank means. Yes, and, the, yes. and this is the uh, three by three matrix. So. Basically, the, this means this matrix uh, is inversible. So it can solve for the uh, input sequence. Yes. So what about this case? We can work out the same algebra. So this is the final state uh, vector. And again, this is a controllability matrix. But now you see this matrix um, is rank deficient. It has only two independent columns. So no matter how we train the input signals, we can never explore the whole state space. And uh, if you work out the algebra, you will realize that actually the, the two state variable, x, x2 and x3, that satisfy this condition. Well, of course, due to this symmetry. And due to this symmetry and this, um, this constraint, the system is stuck in the state space. That's the reason why um, it's uncontrollable. Is it clear? To make the system controllable, as I mentioned, you can introduce an additional signal. So uh, I show you this simple example where we controlling um, we are controlling node one and node two with two independent signals. You can check that the the controllability matrix has full rank. So this simple system is is controllable, and we call those two nodes. They accept independent signals uh, to be driver nodes because if you if we control those nodes, then the system is uh, is controllable. Of course, the question is how to find the minimum number of driver nodes because if you um, naively control all the nodes independently, the system is guaranteed to be controllable, but that's not feasible. And uh, we want to find the minimum set of driver nodes for a complex network, of course, with linear time invariant dynamics. We wonder how uh, network characteristic determine the number of driver nodes and uh, how robust is network controllability against node or, or link failure. Um, there are many difficulties, many levels of this. 
first of all, the system parameters like the link widths um, are usually unknown, especially for biological uh, networks. We know two nodes interact with each other, but we don't know um, how strong the interactions are. And the second difficulty comes from the common rank condition. Even though this is a sufficient necessary condition for the system to be uh, controllable, however, the controllability matrix is of dimension n times nm. n is the number of nodes, m is the number of uh, inputs that control signals. So um, for very large uh, uh, matrix, checking the rank condition is very uh, numerically unstable. Last but not least, if we, even though if we uh, have an efficient algorithm to solve this um, uh, rank condition problem, still we need to find a, a very efficient algorithm because if we do the brute force search for the minimum number of driver nodes, we have to check all the possible combinations, which is two to the power of n, to the order of two to the power of n, which is uh, sounds hopeless even for small network size. So uh, we came up with a solution and uh, we published a paper um, three years ago on, on Nature. The solution is based on a uh, very interesting mapping between control theory and, and uh, graph theory is about structure controllability and max matching. First, let me talk about the structure control theory. And uh, this was mainly de developed by this gentleman, Ching Tai Ling. Unfortunately, he quit academia after he published this paper. So even in control community, structure control theory is not a well-known um, theory. So um, he published this paper entitled Structure Controllability, which is a, a, a beautiful paper. And uh, let me give you the basic idea of controllability. So basically, you, you know the network structure. You know who connect to, connect to whom. And you also know who you are controlling. But you don't know the interaction weights. You don't know the, uh, the strength of the signal. You just know the, the, uh, the, the, the topology of the control system. And uh, you just model the system as, well, two matrices. A is the um, um, weighted wiring diagram, or the state matrix. B is the, the, the input matrix. And we consider those matrices are structured matrix, in the sense that the elements in the structured matrices are either fixed zeros, which means there's no connection between two nodes, or the, the strengths are independent free parameters. Then if, we, if you assume those matrices are structure matrices, then um, only the structure matters. How shall we uh, appreciate this statement? Let me give you an example. example actually. Uh, this is the direct path. We know how to solve the problem. We, we write on the A matrix or the B matrix and then work out the C matrix. In this case, is the, the C matrix has full rank, so the system is controllable. Even without using structure control, know that because if those those link weights basically are non-zero, then this matrix is guaranteed to have uh, a full rank. For this case, the system is not controllable. No matter how you turn the the link weights, as long as they are uh, uh, non-zero, the, this matrix has um, uh, rank two, which is uh, rank deficient. And in this case, the system is controllable as long as those parameters are non-zero. But how about this case? So can anyone tell me whether the system, in other, word, in other words, whether this matrix has full rank or not? Yes or no? Why, why not? Well, yes, but there's a little, like, uh, there's a feedback loop. Uh, what do you mean by the feedback loop? You mean this, this? Yeah. Well, um, well, it really depends, I, I, would, I would say. It's not a yes or no problem. It depends on the system parameters. If the system parameters are chosen in such a way that those two columns are proportional to each other, in the extreme case, uh, they are equal, those, which means those parameters satisfy this, this condition, then these two columns are identical. They are not independent. Of, of course, the system is not controllable. However, um, in the very beginning of the structure control theory, we assume those link uh, widths are independent. That means the probability for this condition to hold is almost zero. So that means the system is almost controllable for all the possible parameter configurations. And that's really the essential 
part of the structure control theory. That means the system is structurally controllable for almost all the possible um, weed comb uh, combinations because the uncontrollable case is pathological. The system parameters, uh, they have to satisfy a particular constraint, and that constraint is very hard to uh, achieve if you assume that a system parameters are independent. And this is really the key point of the structure control theory. Okay. Does this make sense? Okay. Then the question is, when is the system structurally controllable? Again, I think um, prove the necessary and the sufficient condition to check whether the uh, structured system is structurally controllable or not. Uh, to introduce the main result of the structure control controllability theorem, I have to introduce a few concepts. Um, they are very uh, simple. First is about inaccessibility. Suppose you have a network, and one node is isolated from the rest. Of course, by controlling the other part of the system, this node is not controllable at all. You can, there's no direct path from the input sequence to this node. Even though if there is a direct path from this node to this one, again, there's no direct path from the input sequence to this one. So this node is inaccessible, and the system is not controllable, of course. Another concept is the so-called dilution. It's kind of a branching. If you think about uh, this part of the, this set of nodes, one to four, you can find the so-called neighborhood set. In this case, is node five, because the, the node five can reach this set of nodes. And the neighborhood, side, the neighborhood set has size smaller than the original set. That's the definition of dilation, then the dilation occurs. CTD proved that those are the only two scenarios that the system become uncontrollable. And that's a really a beautiful result. I introduced the so-called uh, stem and a bud. Stem is nothing but a direct path, and you are controlling the first guy. And a bud is a direct circle, and you're controlling any, any node in the circle. From stem and bud, he can the so-called character structures, which, which is uh, the minimum structure or the control skeleton, which contains neither inaccessible nodes or dilations. And if you have a bunch of characters, then you have a cacti. So how do we understand this? Why the character is the minimum structure, which contains neither inaccessible nodes nor dilations? Well, if you have a character structure, basically if you have a stem and you grow some buds on the stem, you have a cactus. If you remove any links in the, um, in the character structure, you will end up with inaccessible nodes. For example, here, I remove this link. Then this part of the, the, the system becomes inaccessible. Right? It's very uh, intuitive. Uh, if we remove, for example, this link, then this part will be the dilation. Why is that? Because if you choose this node, those two nodes, as the set, then the neighborhood set contains only one node. So there's a dilation here. But why in the original character structure there's no dilation? Because if you again choose those two nodes as a set, then the neighborhood set contains two nodes, actually this one and this one. So there's no dilation in the character structure. But if you remove any link, you will end up with inaccessibility and a dilation. That's the reason why characters is a minimum structure. Based on the, the property of the character structure, uh, CTD proved the, the structure controllability theorem. So basically, a linear control system is structurally controlled um, if and only if the digraph contains neither in dilations nor inaccessible nodes. And uh, uh, equivalently, the, the digraph is spanned by cacti in the sense that, that, that there's underlying cactus structure. So let me give you a, a small example. Suppose we have a direct network with very complicated uh, topology. And we are controlling this network with three independent signals connected uh, to five nodes, one, two, three, four, five. And uh, you can realize that there's an underlying cacti structure. And uh, due to uh, CTD and structure controllability theorem, the system is guaranteed to be controllable. Um, I'm going to introduce the matching concept. Before I do that, let me introduce the so-called U-rooted factorial connection, which is nothing, a set of direct paths and direct circles, which is closely related to the matching algorithm I'm going to talk about. So the 
Natural clustering is how to make a system structurally controllable with minimum control inputs. That's a, the, the ultimate question we want to address. Um, this is, as I said, this is uh, related to, to the matching, which is a classical notion in uh, theory. So typically, matching um, is defined for undirected network as a set of edges without common vertices. For example, we have an undirected network here. Those two edges, basically, they, are, uh, they form a uh, uh, a matching in the sense that those two edges, the red ones, they do not touch each other, they do not share common nodes. A max matching is a matching of the largest size. And if all the nodes are matched in the sense that they are the ending nodes of uh, the matching edge, for example, these, those green nodes, they are called match, otherwise they are unmatched. If all the nodes are matched, then we call there's a, a perfect matching. And for a general undirected network, in principle, there could be many different max matchings and, for example, in this case, and they all share the uh, same size. We generalize the, the concept of matching to direct network because we want to study the controllability for general uh, complex direct network. And we define matching to be a set of direct edges without common heads or tails. So in the sense that those two scenarios are not allowed if those two edges belong to the same um, uh, matching because they either share the common heads or the, cam or the common tail. So, for example, we have a direct path. You can convince yourself all the edges that form the matching. One head of an um, uh, edge is the tail of another edge. They never share the common head or tail. If you have a direct circle, then all the edges belong to the uh, uh, max matching. If you have a direct star, then only one edge could belong to the max matching because those three edges, they share the common head. And then based on the, the concept of uh, matching in a uh, uh, direct network, we prove the so-called minimal input theorem. So basically for, um, for a structured system, the minimum number of driver nodes are given by basically the, the number of unmatched nodes. If all the nodes are matched, then you need at least one signal to control the system. So let me give you an example. Uh, again, uh, this example I showed you uh, a few slides before. We have this network and we control this network with three in inputs. And we know there's a cacti structure. I mentioned that uh, uh, in the underlying the cacti structure, actually there is a so-called U-rooted factorial connection, which is nothing, uh, nothing but a set of direct paths and direct circles. You see that those direct paths and direct circles, which colored in red, nothing but max matching. And because we solve the max matching problem, the number of unmatched nodes is guaranteed to be the minimum. And we prove that the uh, the number of the minimum number of driver nodes are nothing but the the minimum number of uh, 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 unmatched nodes. So you can see uh, if we have uh, a max matching um, structure and we are controlling the unmatched nodes, then there is a so-called u root factor connection, and uh, then it's guaranteed there will be a cacti structure. That's the reason. Uh, that's how we prove the minimum input theorem, because uh, if, we, if you control the, the minimum unmatched nodes, then the, si the system uh, has a cacti structure. So we can use Citilin's theorem to, to guarantee the, the controllability. And in the community, they have uh, developed many different graphical representations. Uh, they even introduced the concept of matching in the bipartite graph representation. But in, in our case, we, develop, we define the matching on the direct network uh, directly in the sense that we don't need to go to the bipartite representation so that we can relate the max matching to the, uh, to the character theorem uh, directly. So here's the methodology. Suppose we ha have a direct network and uh, we can find the max matching of this direct network. And those nodes that are unmatched are nothing but the driver nodes. You introduce signals to control those unmatched nodes, then the system is guaranteed to be, con to be controllable. And in general, there could be many different uh, uh, max matchings, which give you uh, a freedom to control the system using different control configurations. So essentially, we turn the brute force search um, task, which is almost hopeless, into a very efficient algorithm, the max matching algorithm, which can be solved in polynomial time, even for very large network. And uh, I can show you a, a movie um, so that we can appreciate the, the structure control theorem because there's underlying character structures 
for structurally controllable system. So for any direct network, if you solve the max matching problem, basically you can construct the character structures and the roots of the characters are nothing but the driver nodes of the system. And uh, you see those, those are the stems, those are the bots. And as a network scientist, we want to understand which characteristic determine the minimum number of drive nodes. And we know that there are many um, famous network models. Um, two of them are the so-called Erdstrani model and a Schofield model. We know that in the Erdstrani model, uh, the degree distribution of uh, the network follows the Poisson degree distribution. And in, in skill-free network, the degree distribution is, is a power law. And in many real world networks, we have uh, these skill free or at least fat tailed degree distributions. And uh, the, the skill free networks, um, they have a very um, 
a special property, the, the robustness of the structure due to the presence of hubs, those nodes with very high degree. And uh, here I'm showing you two movies to sh uh, basically to, to show you that the skill-free network are very robust to random failure. In the left-hand side, I randomly remove nodes. You see the network shrinks, but it's doesn't, it does not uh, break into pieces. In the uh, right-hand side, I targetedly remove nodes with highest degree. Then you see the network break into pieces very quickly. So basically, the, the hubs, the nodes with very high degree, they are the so-called Achilles heel of the skill-free network. So hubs play a very important role in the structure robustness of skill-free networks. And of course, hubs matter in many other problems. For example, the spreading phenomena. You can prove that for the skill-free networks, um, in the thermodynamic limit, which means the network size is infinite. the uh, second moment of the degree distribution diverge, for example, if the degree exponent gamma is less than three, then the epidemic threshold lambda c goes to zero, which means if the epidemic occurs, then you can never stop it. Then the question is, what is the role of hubs in controllability? We know that the hubs play so important role in other problems. To answer this question, we uh, did two types of experiments. First we classify the nodes into three groups, the low degree, the middle degree, and high degree. Then for each group, we calculated the fraction of driver nodes. And you see that for both uh, model networks, the fraction of driver nodes is significantly higher among low degree nodes than among the hubs. Um, the second experiment is even more straightforward. We just calculated the mean degree of the driver nodes and compared to the mean degree of the whole network. And you see that the mean degree of driver nodes for most uh, real-world networks, they are either significantly smaller or comparable to the mean degree of the whole network. So both experiments suggest that the driver nodes tend to avoid hubs, which is a kind of counterintuitive result. So now, the, since the hub do not matter for controllability, then really matters. To answer this question, we use the common trick in network science. We do uh, the so-called randomization. We randomize the network. And uh, there are at least two types of randomization. First, we, you can do the complete randomization. You keep the number of nodes and links unchanged, but otherwise just rewire the, uh, those links. Essentially, you will turn the network into a kind of urge any type of random network. The degree distribution will be Poisson. If you do that, then you compare the number of driver nodes of the real network and the randomized network. You see there's almost no correlations which means if you do the complete randomization, then basically you remove all the features that um, determine the number of driver nodes. However, if you do the degree preserved randomization, not only you keep the number of nodes and links unchanged, but also you keep the degree sequence unchanged. In other words, you keep the in degree and out degree for each node unchanged. Then uh, you do this comparison, you will see that there's a strong correlation uh, between the real uh, uh, between the number of uh, driver nodes for the real network and the randomized, randomized networks. So that means the number of driver nodes is mainly determined by the degree distribution. This, is, this result is not only surprising, but also is very powerful in the sense that this allows us to do some analytical calculation using the cavity method developed in uh, glass theory in statistical physics. So, uh, so the basic idea is that we define the um, generating function for the, for the degree distribution of this network. Then we derive some self-consistent equations. By solving those self-consistent equations, we can calculate the ensemble average number of driver nodes with all the possible network realizations with the same degree distribution. So this is ensemble average. 
if you compare the analytical results and the numerical ones, they, are, uh, they agree well with each other. And we can also study the, um, we can also derive other results for um, infinite large networks. So for example, for the early training network, in the thermodynamic limit, you can derive the fraction of drive nodes uh, which decay exponentially. For the purely skill-free networks, uh, with only one parameter gamma, you can derive ND as a function of gamma. And you see that the ND approach one, one gamma approach two, in the sense that you have to control almost all the nodes for a purely skill-free network with a very small degree exponent. So those two experiments, uh, two uh, results suggest that sparse and heterogeneous networks are harder to control than dense and homogeneous networks. When we ask the question, how robust is network controllability against node uh, failure or link failure? Uh, then I'm going to focus on the, the link failure. Um, to answer this question, we do a simple classification of nodes. We categorize the links in the network into three types. The first type is so-called critical links. They belong to all the maximizer chains. And if you remove uh, one of the critical links, then you have to uh, uh, control more nodes, which means the number of driver nodes will increase. For example, if you have a direct path, then all the links are critical. If you remove any one of them, you have to control more nodes, which is intuitive. Intuitively, why we call it they are uh, critical. The second type of links are called redundant. They belong to no max matchings. You can safely remove them. This will not change the, uh, the driver node set. This will not increase the number of drive nodes. For example, in this network, this link is redundant. You can remove it, but the system can still be controllable uh, within the same, uh, uh, using the same set of driver nodes. The rest uh, uh, links are called ordinary. They belong to some, but not all max matchings. So they are neither critical nor redundant. For example, if you have a direct star, then all the links are, re are ordinary in the sense that um, you can, um, in the sense that those links, they do not belong to all the max matchings. Uh, I'm sorry, they belong to some max matchings, but not all the max matchings. If you find the links and uh, if you do the classification for a real-world networks, you will, realize, you will realize that, in general, most networks have very few or no critical links, but they have considerable number of redundant links. Here, the redundant links, the fraction are colored in gray. So you see uh, uh, that that's just the, the real-world real networks are relatively robust against uh, link removal. And uh, also, you see that most links are because most links are ordinary, that means the, the ordinary links, they play a role in some control configurations, but the networks can still be controlled without them. The result for the real-world network is really kind of messy. We do not see um, any other general trend. But if we study the link in model networks, we see a very interesting phenomenon. So here we calculated the fraction of three types of links against uh, a network parameter, for example, the mean degree for the early training network. You see that the critical link, the density decrease monotonically, but the redundant link, the density increase and then decrease. So, so something happened at this particular mean degree between four and six. So here's a question for you. So can you imagine any um, interesting number between four and six? Five? It's slightly above five, so five is not five. Use your imagination. It's two e. E is the Euler number, two point seven one eight two eight one eight two eight. So. So it's twice the interesting number. Yes, it's a. Twice the interesting number. Yes, yes, because it's a direct network. Yeah. So this is, in computer science, this is a so-called E phenomena because they, they find a very similar phenomena in, uh, in solving the max matching problem for undirected network. In that case, uh, similar things happen at E. But here we are talking about direct network, so it happens at 2E. So what happens at this particular mean degree? Well, it turns out that this, um, this is related to a very interesting percolation problem. So, uh, core population uh, 
is defined based on the so-called greedy leaf removal procedure in the sense that you re recursively remove in leaf and all leaf nodes neighbors all outgoing or incoming edges. I know this definition is quite weird, but let me give you an example. So we have a direct network. So you find the in leaf in the sense that this node has in degree one. So it has only one incoming link. And then you identify its neighbor, which is J. You remove all the outgoing links of its neighbor, J. You see, so basically you remove all the links, outgoing links of J. You end up with this scenario. And you keep doing this, which means recursively, remove all the in-leaf and all, uh, all leaf nodes neighbors, out, outgoing and uh, incoming edges. Of course, if the network is um, dense enough, then eventually you will end up with a uh, um, you will end up with a very uh, dense connected subgraph. If the network is very sparse, then eventually all the nodes will be isolated. Let me show you a, a few examples. So we have a Dishrani network with 500 nodes, mean degree three. If you do the greedy leaf removal, then all the, all the links will be removed. All the nodes will become isolated, nothing left. If you slightly increase the mean degree, for example, to five, if you do the uh, greedy leaf removal, then you will see there will be a, a tiny core left. If you keep increasing the mean to 7, which is about 2e, then you see uh, there will be a giant core. Left. So this is so-called the, uh, the core population. A very special subgraph in the network emerge when you increase the mean degree. So if you calculate the fraction of the core, you see at 2e, the core merge. And this actually will explain why the redundant link density will decrease. Because once the core develops, the number of maximums actually in increase exponentially. Uh, we can do this calculation again using a cavity method. We can calculate the entropy density of max matchings, which is defined to be the logarithmic of the max matchings divided by the system size. And the entropy density you see will increase um, when the core develops. And because the redundant links are defined to be links not belonging to any max matchings, if the number of max matchings uh, grows exponentially, then the chance for a link to not belonging to any max matching, of course, will decrease. That, uh, that's the reason why the redundant link uh, will uh, decrease. And there are a bunch of applications of this uh, um, linear control framework for complex networks. I don't think I have time to go through um, any of them. Um, let me talk about observability of my talk. So a system is called observable if the system's current state can be determined in finite time using only the system outputs. For example, you measure the, the states of a few nodes as a function of time. If the observations enable you to infer the initial state of other nodes, then the system is called observable. The motivation of this um, um, problem is due to this very funny uh, figure. You see the, the x-axis is the time, the y-axis I'm showing you the number of publications on biomarkers and the number of FDA approved biomarkers. You see despite the increasing rates of uh, publications on biomarkers, the number of FDA approved biomarkers is decreasing. So what does this tell us? Well, that just means many publications are not very useful for us to find um, FDA-approved biomarkers. So our approach, um, we want to solve this. We want to improve the situation by using control theory. And our approach is based on the, those two points. We want to perform the observability analysis of a mathematically well-defined biological system, the biochemical reaction system. For example, the metabolic network. Can I ask a quick question? Sure. Yes. Do you mean you can reconstruct the whole structure of it only from its outputs? I mean, the, the state, the initial state, not the structure of the network. We have to assume we know the network structure. So the assumption is you already know the structure. Yes. From, but we don't know the initial from the state. Outputs, you can determine the other values within the network, the other values of the signals. Yes, yes. The, the other state variables, yes. Okay. Yeah. So our key assumption in this um, approach is that those components, those nodes, if 
which if monitored can be used to determine uh, the host state of the system, to infer the host state of the system via the sensors or the biomarkers. So essentially we want to use control theory to guide rational biomarker design. Uh, the question will be um, posed in a, in a very general nonlinear dynamic system context. So what is the minimum number of sensor nodes and how to efficiently identify them? For the metabolic network or biochemical reaction system, the question is how to find the minimum set of metabolites so that by measuring their concentrations, we can infer all other metabolized concentrations. You can think about a, a, a bunch of simple chemical reactions or the genome scale metabolic networks. Um, the problem is very interesting in the sense that if the, if the dynamics is linear, then it's very easy to identify those sensors because we can utilize the so-called quality between observability and controllability for linear system. In the sense that if the system is observable, uh, then the dual system is controllable. To get the dual system actually is very simple if you use a uh, network language. Suppose this is the system we want to observe. We want to find the sensors for this system. To get the dual system, basically you just flip the direction of each edge. So you get a dual system. Okay, so basically you transpose the A matrix. Then you use the minimum input theorem, you find a driver nodes for this um, dual system. The driver node in this case is X3. Then the driver node for this system is nothing but the sensor node for the original system. So for linear system, the driver nodes of the transpose network are sensor nodes for the original network. So the problem is solved. But however, for, however, for biological systems, they are uh, highly nonlinear. So how to solve this problem? It turns out that the biochemical system are a very special type of nonlinear system in the sense that the, the dynamics are polynomial or rational. And for the rational systems, the observability can be determined by the dimension of the space spanned by the gradients of the lead derivative of its outer functions. So essentially, we have a rank condition to check the algebraic observability of biochemical reaction system, and uh, which is very similar to the, to the rank condition um, for, linear, for linear time invariant system, the common rank condition. But again, we have many difficulties. First of all, the parameters are usually unknown. The dynamics are highly nonlinear, even though there's this polynomial dynamics. And the rank condition is even harder to, ch to check because we have to deal with uh, symbolic calculation. And the last but not least, we have this combinatorial problem. So how to solve this problem? How to find the minimum number of sensors? Well, it turns out that the solution is very simple. It's even simpler than the, uh, the linear controllability case. It's based on the so-called graphic approach and the inference diagram. And it has been reinvented many times. So, so the basic idea is that suppose you have an ordinary differential equation for one particular node, xi. If xj appears in the right-hand side, you basically you just draw a link from xi to xj. It sounds trivial, but it's meaningful in the sense that if you measure xi um, over time, as a function of time, of course, you can calculate the time derivative of xi. And that time derivative of xi, by definition, uh, give you some information ab about xj. So this arrow actually, actually means some kind of information flow. You measure xi, you get some you're collecting some information about xj. So we published this paper uh, two years ago in PNAS. And let me give you a few examples about this graphic approach. Suppose we have a very simple biochemical reaction. A goes to B. Compound A goes to compound B. Can you tell me which one should we measure so that we can infer the other? Either A or B, so 50% chance. Compound A tends to compound B. Which one should we measure so we can infer the initial state of the other? A. A is not correct, so. Anyone else? Uh, measuring A does not work. Does not work in the sense that if you measure A, you can never get information about B. You can never get the initial state information of, about B, because if you write down the dynamic equations, you see x1 dot equal minus k1 x1. If you measure x1 over time, you get a time derivative, but the time derivative of x1 only include the information of Excel itself. You see x1 dot equal minus k1, minus k1 x1. 
But if you measure the concentration of B as a function of time, you see x2 dot equal k1 x1. So immediately you get information about A. So, but without using the, the, the equations, you can draw the so-called inference diagram using the, the, the simple trick I mentioned uh, one slide before. So you see there's a self-loop of A because if you measure A, you get information of, of A itself. If you measure B, then you are collecting some information about A. So measuring B is necessary, and in this case, it's not only necessary, but also sufficient. Another example, A plus B goes to C, B plus QC goes to D. Which one should we measure? A, B, C, or D? D, okay. Because I'm asking them questions, then they ask me, so yeah. I know I have 10 minutes, right? Okay, I will wrap, wrap up, okay. <laughs> this is, now it's 10.50, right? Yeah, it's 45 plus questions. So it's, it's okay. I mean, it's been so much interactive. Yeah, interactive is the, the essential point of school, summer school, right? The interaction has been, you ask a question and nobody gives you the answer. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, A, B, C, or D? D. Yes, D. Because if you don't measure D, you can never collect information about D. There's no incoming link to D. So measuring D is necessary, right? But I will surprise you, actually, measuring D is also sufficient in this case. How about this case? A goes to B plus C, B goes to D, and vice versa. So it's a reversible reaction. A, B, C, or D, or any combination. Yeah, C is necessary. Measuring C is necessary. Any note else? Yes, I hear the combination. Basically, you can measure either C, you can measure C and either B or D. The reason is that B and D they form the so-called strongly connected component. So you see, if you consider B and D as a component, there's no incoming link to B and D. So you have to measure at least one of them. And measuring C is obvious. So the a graphic approach works as follows. For a general biochemical reaction system, you write on the ODEs using any kinetics you want. And then you construct the inference diagram. Uh, then you basically do the strongly connected component decomposition, SCC. You see here we have five different SCCs. And uh, I color those root SCCs in gray. Those root SCCs, that they have no incoming links. That means you have to measure at least one of them. So this gives you the lower bound of the number of uh, uh, sensors, which is the, basically the, the number of root SCCs. It turns out that monitoring one sensor node for each root SCC in, is often sufficient for observability. And we check this statement uh, by constructing random reaction system and we create 1,000 chemical reaction system with up to uh, 221 compounds involved in 121 mass balance reactions. It turns out that in, for uh, most of the systems are observable by monitoring one sensor node for each root SEC. But we do find some counterexamples. Those counterexamples that exist when they are reactions, for example, these reactions are reversible and uh, um, suppose it's isolated from the rest of the system, then we have trouble. But I'm going to argue that this is, this is almost never the case in reality because if you have, a, of course, the reversible reactions are very common, but to have isolated reversible reaction is very rare in the sense that when you construct the system, if there is a, a isolated reaction, maybe you will not, uh, you will not include that into uh, your model in the very beginning. Um, and the symmetries in the state variables, you see, if you have a reversible reaction, you construct the inference diagram, you see the, the, the symmetry about this topology. The symmetry in the state variables will cause the system unobservable. And the underlying uh, reason is that the non-trivial subalgebra of the model symmetries will let, will let the inputs and outputs of the system be invariant. That, uh, that means the system is unobservable, no matter how you measure the outputs of the system. And we test this graphic approach on um, some uh, uh, small biochemical reaction system, uh, for example, the uh, cell cycle um, in fission list. We also test um, 
from the genome scale metabolic network. In this case, uh, in this slide, basically, I want to highlight two columns. Here is the number of metabolites. Here is the number of sensors. You see that, in principle, we can reconstruct the state of the whole metabolism, metabolism from the concentration of a relatively small fraction of metabolites. We can also use graphic approach to, to solve the so-called target observability problem. Suppose we don't care the initial state of the whole system. We just care a particular compound, how to infer the initial state. For example, here, we want to know the initial state of compound A. Of course, naively, you can measure, measure it. But suppose measuring A is not feasible, which node should we, should we measure? B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K. Which one should we measure? Suppose we want to know the concentration of A, and measuring A directly is not feasible, which one should we measure? Any guess? I have five minutes left, so. You should measure either B or C because they are very close to A. They belong to the same strongly, uh, strongly connect component. So essentially, we can uh, target observability problem into a very simple optimization problem. So in this case, we want to infer the state of A. We can either measure B or C. But if, or, but if neither B nor C is available, which one should we measure? I'm not going to challenge you. I'm going to tell you the answer. In this case, we should measure F. Why is that? Because if you measure F, then the subsystem you need to deal with has the smallest size. In this case, it's 4. If you measure either any other nodes, for example, D or E, then the subsystem contains five nodes, which is bigger. You can convince yourself that measuring F is the optimal choice. So basically, I show you two projects, um, controllability and observability. Controllability is based on linear time invariant system and is heavily uh, based on the structure control theory and the, and the max matching concept. Observability is developed for a very special type of nonlinear system, the biochemical reaction system. In that case, we can check the algebraic observability using um, a symbolic calculation. So the take home message of my talk is many dynamic problems can be quantitatively studied via a combination of tools from control theory, network science, and statistical physics. Uh, last but not least, I would like to thank collaborators and uh, my funding agencies, and also I'd like to thank you for your attention.